Super Nintendo launches in the USA. Photoshop dethrones deluxe paint. And Japan is trading the next gen of game devs. These stories and many more on this episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. I've been waiting a long time for a chance to say this. Stop the presses. Requiescat in pace. Make some crazy money. What is a man? It's me, Mario. What a mess. Get over here! Please save me. Welcome back to another episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine, the show where we travel back in time to see what was making headlines in the video game and home computer industries 20, 30, and 40 years ago. Today, we're turning the time machine back 30 years to October of 1991. I'm your host, Carl, and I'm here again with our very esteemed co-host, Mads. Say hi, Mads. It simply blows my mind that you just said that 91 was 30 years ago. I was thinking, nah, maybe <laughs> you've got the wrong jump here, but damn. 91 is 30 years ago? Yeah, and it's almost over. That's the worst oh, part, isn't it? Crap. I'm getting old. Hi, oh, tell me about it. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, believe me, uh, this, uh, yeah, this is a very special moment for me as well because this was right, right before I left Argentina. I'm going to leave Argentina in December of 91, yep. arrive in Germany in January of 92, and it's like, yeah, dude, it's the last couple of years of high school and uh, things are just, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. It's weird. <laughs> and I can remember as if it was only yesterday. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a lot of other days between then and now, but uh, who's counting? So uh, let's, let's, uh, I guess we got right into the banter. So uh, Mads, how you been? I've been fine, mate. Fine playing some good old school computer games lately. Actually, I've been playing a game that you'll uh, get a kick out of because I know you like, uh, I remember your, your great interview with Al Lowe, so you like your Leisure Suit Larry games. And, yeah. Uh, so I've been playing the uh, the original Leisure Suit Larry game before it was called Leisure Suit Larry. So Soft Porn Adventure, the text of it. Oh, awesome. I've, I've almost finished it. Today I, uh, I turned it off when I was in the hot tub with, uh, with the, the final girl. Um, mm. Yeah, so I still need to figure out how to, um, well, get her late. But <laughs> it's uh, it's been been good fun seeing it, how, where Alicia Sid Larry came from because this game made. Uh, have you played it? I, that's the weird thing. I started playing it all, not thirty years ago, but at least twenty years ago. Yeah. And uh, this was, you know, right at the time when DOSBox was starting and stuff. And mm. I played it probably for about 10 minutes and then got distracted and never went back. And it is a game that I, I definitely need to go back to. We, we were just talking about it on the show uh, last episode or the episode before that, because it was the 40th anniversary of the game. Mm, yeah. 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 Well, it, it, I'm playing the old uh, original Apple II version mm. and, and it's, um, it's 80, 90% just Lisa shoot Larry one without the graphics yeah. it's the same same puzzles same stuff you need to pick up same everything so i was i was surprised i knew that lisa suit larry was heavily inspired by soft porn adventure i didn't know that it was actually just a remake with graphics of soft porn adventure but it seems oh, yeah. to be yeah uh and when i interviewed uh, ken williams he actually talked about that yeah that they were just trying to update it so in a way it was like the first update they did to one of their games you know how they yeah. did the vga updates later on of the ega games uh no they were just trying to figure out a way to rekindle it and al Lowe took a look at it and he said yeah all the references in this are so outdated because uh, they're thinking i believe they start development somewhere in 86 on it yeah. if i'm if i'm uh, correct he says, everything is so outdated, this guy needs to be wearing a leisure suit. And that's the inspiration for the character of Leisure Suit Larry and how he gets put into that game. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I must have forgotten that part because uh, I was I, I, I was 
thinking I pick up a game now that's uh, about fifty percent least suit Larry one and fifty percent something else. But really, this is this is all mm. least suit Larry. So, uh, yeah, but it's it's been good fun uh, revisiting yeah. it. So or, or revisiting the 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 least suit Larry game in some way. That's cool. Now, uh, and, and that's probably a spoiler. I don't know if you remember how Leisure Suit Larry One ends, but uh, uh, what's the name of the girl in the hot tub? Right now, she's uh, she's called Eve, isn't she? Yeah. Well, what do you think you need to give her? An apple. Bingo. <laughs> so I know where I can find an apple core with some apple seeds in it. So I'm. I'm uh, I'm I'm getting there in my mind. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. See, uh, just just thought I'd help you along there, but yeah, yeah. That, I mean, yeah, I, I, it's one of those games where just for the sake of being able to say I did it because I'm such a fan of the series, I, I probably need to go back and do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can do that quite quickly now when you know at least you should Larry one so well. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I've played through that. I've played through the EGA version probably twice, the VGA version at least twice. So I think I can pull this off. Yeah. It's, so yeah. I've always preferred, I mean, I, I really like the look of the, the rehashed VGA version, but I've always preferred the EGA, EGA one because there's just, there's more nostalgia there for me. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm torn because I did play the EGA version very, very close to the VGA version. Okay. Uh, I, the first one I played was actually three. A buddy of mine had that, and then I acquired all of the uh, all the ones before uh, a year or two later for the Amiga. But I acquired them all in one batch, so I suddenly had one, two, three, and the remake of one. Okay. All in my hands at the same time. Mm. So I did play the EGA one through first. And then I almost immediately went through and played the VGA version. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, what, what feels wrong about the VGA version is the, the switch to the point and click interface. It's just uh, just in suit the first couple of uh, Lisa Suit Larry's. One, two, and three. I mean, mm. I'm used to controlling those with the with the keyboard and, and issuing commands with the with the text parser. And, yeah. Well, and that's the weird thing because I played them on the Amiga and I may not be true of one. I may just be misremembering it. But on two and three, you could use the mouse on the Amiga okay. versions. Mm. And one may have also been already that way with the Amiga version, where you clicked any. Now, there was no pathfinding. It was just a straight line. Yeah. But still, you could do that. So I never had to control it with the keyboard in that okay. sense. Okay. And that, or you could use a joystick. The joystick was also always an option on the Amiga, which, you know, yeah, you could, I believe, also do it on the PC with a joystick, but uh, nobody had a joystick back then on PC. So no. everybody did it with the keyboard. So that's why my experience with it has never been as a keyboard controlled game, except for King's Quest 3, where you, if you don't use the keyboard, you're going to fall into pits all the time. So yeah. it's more like playing <laughs> E.T. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I also told King Williams that I was like, I've played through every King's Quest except that one. But yeah, ah, good times. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm looking forward to the episode when you guys talk about that because uh, I, I do want to hear everybody's experiences with it. Yeah, yeah. I know a few of our listeners have finished it. It's it's quite a short game, so a few of our <laughs> listeners have finished it already. We're playing it in a game club, of course. Uh, yeah. But uh, I'm still working my way through it, so. <laughs> yeah. It's curious also as a, as a side note, because it's Sierra's only non-graphical game they ever released. Yeah, that's true, actually. <clears throat> Think about it. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it didn't, it wasn't an internal development. Somebody okay. approached them with a finished game. But it's quite quite graphic in its depictions uh, in the text, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. That uh, well, from the little bit I remember, although it's not all that bad, is it? Most of it is not that bad. There there are some things in here that uh, you really they're really cringe worthy today. Some thing, uh, things are downright uh, despicable. I mean, uh, it, despicable. Uh, it's uh, well. I don't think I want to go into it here. This is a family show, isn't it? So, <laughs> some, some of the things you do here is um, definitely not something you do today, and for good reason. 
I'll believe it. I mean, it's it is definitely a game of that late seventies, you know, sort of the age when movies like uh, the uh, Behind the Green Door or Deep Throat were shown in regular theaters. You know, yeah. it was that attempt to make porn mainstream type of thing, uh, or like we talked about last episode when we did the 40 year jump in October, the, there, uh, there was also an attempt to try to commercialize and mainstream pornographic computer software. Mm. Uh, and yeah, it, it's, it's one of those weird little moments in time that kind of went by the wayside and it's probably not a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> <Nah. laughs> now we just have the hot coffee, uh, uh gta uh, vice city yeah yeah no uh, no that was san andreas san andreas, oh, san andreas. Okay. Coffee, yeah. <laughs> okay so uh enough with the banter we've got business to take care of so yes. first off before we can turn on the time machine we need you to spend seven minutes in heaven playing one of the games that was reviewed in october of 1991 now, there was an extensive list to choose from, but of yeah. course we had to choose a game you hadn't played. So things like Wing Commander 2 were out, or Streets of Rage, Stone Cold Classics, those, yeah. EA Hockey, Battle Isle, Ghouls and Ghosts, Micro Machines, King of Monsters, Dragon's Lair 2, Bonk's Revenge. You played all those. Yes, I did. Oh, man, I played a lot of Battle Isle on my Amiga. Loved that game. Yeah, I'm absolutely awesome. I'm I'm almost hoping, did you ever play History Line? No, never. Oh, that was the World War I uh, spinoff game yeah. using the same okay. game engine. Oh, yeah, dude, if you like Battle Isle, you've got to try History Line. Yeah, yeah we'll do. it's really good. Was Battle Isle actually a German game? It was, yes. It was Blue uh, Byte, right? Yeah, yeah Blue Byte. German game, uh, Blue Byte, uh, turn-based strategy, uh, absolutely awesome title. Yeah. But uh, alas, we needed to find something you hadn't played. And, well, there's one game that is not dear to my heart because I played it at the time, but dear to my heart because of the guy who programmed it. And we will talk about that. And that's what you are going to go off and play now. A little game called Turbocharge. Cool. I'll turn on my C64. Awesome. And everybody, we'll see you on the other side. Welcome back, Mads, from your seven minutes in heaven. Thank so, you. So, you played Turbocharge on the Commodore 64. Based on your seven minutes in heaven, describe the game to our listeners. So, to your listeners, it would be described as Chase HQ, but you need to shoot all of the cars, not, not just <laughs> one of them. Just shoot everything that's on the road and you'll be golden. So, this was um, quite an impressive game for the C64. It had some nice... Well, story told in loading screens while it was loading for a long time. But when it, when it finally loaded the game, it was a very smooth scrolling racer um, up to drive forwards and you, you shoot with the button. And if you hold the button down, you can shoot missiles as well. And then just kill everything that's uh, that's on the road, really. Picking up nice. some stuff from the road and uh, avoiding mines. And it's actually quite good. And, and for for the, uh, the Hubble C64, really impressive. But I, I can see it getting a bit samey, though. I, I played only two levels, um, and it was just the same, just driving and shooting everything. Uh, I, I got to the first boss kind of car. Um, and I didn't get to shoot him, so I'd like to have seen what happens if you, if you clear a boss, if there's anything special going on there. But apart from that, yeah, it's uh, it seems to be a good racer and uh, an enjoyable game. Probably not one I would play for a long time because it would be too samey but uh but still good though and i think you assessed it uh very very correctly uh whenever you beat one of those bosses you do get a little cutscene similar to what you had at the end of the first level where they showed you a little 
just basically it's a still image of you know you doing something with the car but uh yeah the this is the downside to this game it's got a super smooth engine but it there's not a lot to it uh not a great variety in the enemies and it's just more of the same over and over again to mm. the point where you it does just get boring unfortunately okay okay yeah but technically quite impressive for the c64 oh definitely definitely and this is why i put it on the list because it is the last c64 game for chris butler who uh, my personal favorite c64 programmer I uh, did uh, the he did mainly arcade ports is what he's known for, but he did Ghost and Goblins, Commando, and of course the great quasi sprite scaling games: Space Harrier, Thunder Blade, uh, Power Drift, which is absolutely brilliant on the system, and uh, then this his last raw, which was an original title, Turbocharge. Hmm. Yeah, well, this was quite good and a lot better than um, say. Champions of the Rush, for example, <laughs> just just to choose and just some game. That that a one really is random game. That one has left a scar, hasn't it? <laughs> yes, it that has. <laughs> really, really left a scar. <laughs> well, see, you should have played it on original hardware, but with a second disc drive. Mm. You were trying to run it with one disc drive, and you know they they were already in the era of well, we have to have at least two disc drives for this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, that that was just terrible. That was absolutely terrible. Oh well, I will put a link to that in the show notes in case anybody wants to go back and uh, relive your uh, your trauma. Yes, because uh, that was bad. That was really, <laughs> really bad. <laughs> okay, uh, before we uh, turn on time machine, we have one more stop, and that is with our good friend Ethan Johnson for a little segment we like to call the Department of Corrections. Welcome back, Ethan. So, hey, be before you tell me everything that I got wrong about September of 1991, we must have the John comment. Yes. And John, I am disappointed in you. You spoke ill of the greatest movie <laughs> ever created. Dune 1984. Shame upon you. I will not stand for any slander against this cinematic marvel. Wait, are we talking about the cinematic cut? Are we talking I'm talking about... about the movie that was created. And it is and glorious in, in all its forms. Oh, really? Glorious in all, in all its, its forms, forms. Carl. <laughs> all its forms. Oh. If you think that there is any significant improvement in the longer cut, you are you are incorrect, for it is beautiful in all its forms. Uh, I, 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 feel, I, I feel like I should probably bite my tongue right now and not go any deeper into this because i i'm afraid i'll never come out of the morass this is this i i'd be getting into something i would not be able to control wouldn't i so even though uh the the new movie will never hope to live up to this piece of art uh still looking forward to it yeah uh i yeah i mean i'm I am horribly, horribly disappointed that they're only doing the first half of the book uh, because at two and a half hours, uh, I understand the desire to do everything, but if you're not doing a mini series, then... Uh, they already did that, though. I know, and this is why. It's like, if you're going to do it as a movie, do it as a movie, which means you're going to have to cut some stuff out uh, and it's and as much as I love Dune the novel, you could cut some stuff out and it would not detract from the movie. You could easily cut some stuff out, but uh, they. So there's our science fiction discussions for the day. But yeah. don't leave such frivolous things behind. We're here to talk about video games. Yeah, I'm sorry. And, I'm sorry. Yes, I could go on for a while. Yes, you are right. Let's get and, back. And to so this. the Department of Corrections 
it forces you to throw out all of your VHS tapes and pay attention <laughs> to the whiteboard in front of you. All right. So first up, uh, the Microprose uh, IPO. Uh, Alex did confirm for me. He had actually found in a uh, Maryland State journal, a business journal of some kind, the Microprose did indeed raise the $18 million that they asked for. Very nice. Okay. So that is a good thing to get confirmed. So they did actually bring in some cash. Yeah, it was not an underfinanced IPO, but at the end of the day, they they needed more than just cash. They needed a a, a good directive for what they were doing. Uh, Civ alone was not going to float them forever. No, no, it wasn't. And yeah. next up, you uh, <laughs> you have the. Uh, Super Mario All-Stars, the original release of Super Mario All-Stars did not have Super Mario World on it because Super Mario World was still new and they were still selling it. So they did a re-release later that had Super Mario World. You're right. You are very right. Okay. Chalk that one up. Excellent. And uh, the, now, now to pronunciation. Now, I do not care where you choose to pronounce this thing. I have my way. But YS, however you want to pronounce it, pick a pronunciation, Carl, and stick to it. Because you did you've done like three different ones. <laughs> so just pick one. What's the correct one? And there's a whole video about this. Uh of but like in, in Japanese, Isu. So is is, 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 yeah, is okay. the Mo is the most accurate. Awesome. Okay. Okay. I think I can uh, remember that. And yes. yes. And final of the year, even though Peter was not here to relish in the destruction of a label under a publisher. Uh, well, I guess a revival. I, I can't remember what the context of this was. But anyways, Infocom. Uh, you you said that Bobby Kotick. Under, like put down Infocom, but no, Bobby, Bobby Kotick did not kill Infocom. Infocom as a company and as a label ha was uh, done under uh, under the reign of uh, Bruce Davis. Uh, Kotick actually saw a lot of value in Infocom. Some of the earliest re-releases -re when he got his everything back up and running were to uh, do Infocom re-releases and uh, further games in, like, the Zork franchise. That, this is true. Yeah. So, blame Kotick for whatever, for whatever you like, but in this case, this one's not, not quite true. Gotcha. Although the plan to do re-releases already came during uh, the previous reign, and that came up in my conversation with Chris Garsky. Because he had been sent there to evaluate them, and that was one of his suggestions, was to do re-releases. But they did not actually do it under uh, That's true. directive, so he, he did not see the value in that. Kotick saw value in that, and he went and implemented it. Cool. Eh? Use that IP. Indeed. Well, Activision has a lot of IP that they could use, but that is... Yeah. On higher business level decisions <laughs> than we will ever get to know. So, September 1991, it is a close. So let us mosey on down and see you next time for September 2001. All right? That sounds like a very short list, actually. I, I'm quite impressed with myself. Oh, oh don't, so. don't get, don't get big in your britches, Mr. Carl. You're going to start <laughs> slipping. I'll be back here after my vacation to yell and scream how could you do this again why do you betray me i fed up with this world i don't want to hurt you i just show my love with my mistakes or something okay this is getting weird okay see you next time uh bye, bye? <laughs> so so june there was a four hour three and a half hour version of that of the the 1994 yeah four um movie yeah yeah the david lynch film actually got totally totally massacred so when it hit theaters in a similar but have you ever watched watchmen 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. Have you seen only the theatrical cut, or did you yeah, watch only like the, the theatrical ex- one? Okay. Well, in the, if you watch the theatrical one, there's a whole bunch of story elements. There's a whole bunch of scenes where it doesn't. You don't really understand why anybody's doing what they're doing. Oh yeah. It just sort of happens. If you watch the extended cut, all those extra exposition moments from the comic were filmed. Ah. So, uh, yeah, the, the the theatrical cut, I walked out going, what the fuck? Uh, and a similar thing happened with a Dune. So when it hit theaters, there's so much that's not explained that doesn't make any sense to anybody who hasn't read the book. Okay. But there's this extended cut where not only does it have, like, a, I think it's 30 minutes or something, intro, which is just still paintings and not a lot of them. You know, and sometimes the camera will focus on one part, focus on the other or whatever. And it's Frank Herbert himself giving a brief history of the Dune universe, explaining the Butlerian Jihad, explaining where this, oh, how, what the spice does and all and all the different factions that are in play and giving this introduction so that when the show starts, you actually have an understanding. So it replaces the Princess Irulan monologue from the from the movie yeah uh from the theatrical cut that was also used on the sega cd version of the original dune game Mm. uh that gets replaced with frank herbert doing that sounds pretty sweet i need to i need to check that out i really enjoyed the 1994 movie i actually watched the the new one recently is it any good because i still haven't seen it no I mean, it, it, it <laughs> suffers from the exact same thing you just said. If you haven't read the books, I've read the books, of course. Hmm. But if you hadn't read the books, you wouldn't understand half of what's going on. And it's it's quite well done. But they spent two and a half hours getting to just about halfway through the book, the first book. Yeah, so, that's so the, what the I movie's heard. not even. They, they haven't even told the story of uh, of Mordeep yet. We know oh, nothing Jesus. about that. So the, we, it, it stops right when the. When they they are stranded in the desert, really. Oh man, yeah. And the problem is that if they're going to do that, they have to film it back to back, like they did with Lord of the Rings or Superman one and two and stuff. Because mm-hmm. getting all those actors back, scheduling that, it's going to be at least four years before they get the second movie made. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Could if be. they even get everybody back. And it was yeah. quite well done, but but I was, it was moving too slow for a lot of the parts, and and still it would would assume you've read the book for some other parts, and it's, uh, yeah, mm. I, I like I like the actors and and everything they built up there, but not even getting through half of the book in in two and a half hours seemed like, um, well, annoyed me a bit at least. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, this is why I've been very hesitant about go uh, watching the movie. I may p- watch it at some point once it hits Netflix or something, mm. but um, I'm not rushing out to the theater to watch it. Uh, so I, I now wish I had watched it so I could just watch it when the second one comes out so I don't have to exactly. wait. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's what I may end up doing too. Uh, I mean, I can always go back and rewatch the TV miniseries. Those were good. Okay. Uh, they look cheap. Did you ever watch those? No. From the, like 2000, 2001, they did two miniseries. The first one, I believe, is uh, – four or five hours long and it's okay. the first book and okay. then they mashed together books two and three into a second miniseries that was the same length mm, okay and uh if you look beyond the terrible terrible special effects in some scenes <laughs> where they're uh in the final episode of the first miniseries they clearly ran out of money so uh, in the first episode, there's these beautiful, for the time, CGI, you know, worms eating the sand crawlers and all that stuff. And then by the last one, it's supposed to be, you know, these giant armies fighting each other in the desert. And it's clearly just a pile of sand in a soundstage in Hungary. And it's the same <laughs> shot of three guys jumping out of the sand like three times in a row. It's it's mm. really, really bad in that regard. But it does cover all the aspects of the book and it does a much better job of you know explaining and giving the motivations and developing the characters so that really works in the uh, in the miniseries 
Uh, and like I said, the David Lynch movie really, really works well once you add in all the extra exposition and stuff. And you need those internal monologues that David Lynch left in there for that sh- movie, for that story to really work. Okay. Hmm. And, uh, and I hear that in the new movie, they left all of those out. Yeah. You know, and yeah, yeah. The, the Lynch movie is great as long as you don't watch the theatrical cut. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. Okay. I'll, I'll need to. I'll need to pick that up at some point. Yeah. Okay. And now, with all this banter and all this stuff that nobody came here to actually hear is over, let's turn on the time machine and head back to October of 1991. Yes, I'm so ready, mate. Yes. AMA show shines despite absences. Yes. And you're going to have to put in the sound effect that we're traveling back in time here at some point. No problem, (laughs) but it's all good. Sound effect. Now there's a new girl in the video arcade. 1991. Virtual reality. The market's very fickle. Okay. Now one more time. Now that we are here in October of 1991. Once more with feeling. The <laughs> AMOA show shines despite absences. With Street Fighter 2 redefining the formula for a hit arcade game, the AMOA show, the show for the arcade machine operators, uh, had relatively few big new video games to show. Capcom's Captain Commando, Microprose's Bots, Atari Steel Talons, Namco's Starblade, and Sega's Rail Riders showed how dedicated upright game cabs could add to a game's appeal, especially in light of increasing home console competition. So the arcade, is is that already starting to slow down in 1991? Yeah, they've actually had a couple years of drought. Mm-hmm. Um, at this point, uh, the NES has been eating their lunch in many ways, and there just hasn't been a lot of innovation. Uh, the last big thing that really gave some new lifeblood to the industry was uh, games like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and S- The Simpsons, which took the side-scrolling beat-em-up uh, genre and by adding well-known licensed characters, better animation, and four-player simultaneous play, something that hadn't really been a fixture in the arcade since Gauntlet. Uh, Once you added those components, uh, kids were flocking back into the arcades to play, but there was really, like, it, it just felt like there's nothing new under the sun, or what is new is just really, really expensive high-end equipment. You yeah, know? But- the 90s, 90 or 91 must have seen the uh, the new Geo, the MBS system come into the, to yes. the arcades and there's so many great games for that. And that was a cheap way for the the, the arcade, uh, well, the, the, the guys running the arcade machines to switch games and with, with the cartridge system. So and one the would NES, think that that would uh, push, push the, the arcade business upwards again. Well, the Neo Geo was launched uh, the end of 1990, if memory serves me right. We covered it here on the show. And so it's been out for about a year, but it doesn't have a killer app yet. Uh, Okay, so Metal Slug isn't there yet? No, Metal Slug is still like four years away, four or five years away. That's that's a very late game for the system. Uh, Bubble Bobble, uh, no, Puzzle Bobble. So yeah. uh, Bust a Move is going to be one of the really big hits. Yeah. Uh, where the Neo Geo makes up for it is simply it's so cheap that you yep. can do it. And once, and like I said, Street Fighter 2 is redefining the formula, but we don't have that onslaught of one-on-one fighters yet. Right now, it's still Street Fighter 2 is it. It only it came out a few months before this. So the idea that everybody's shifting to that, even Capcom, is coming out with a Captain Commando, which is your four-player side-scrolling beat-em-up game again, you know? And what the U.S. guys uh, and Namco, basically through its connections with Atari, they're sharing technology because Namco owns a majority stake in Atari, I believe, at this point, or at least a minority stake, but I believe they're already a a majority stake again here. Uh, Everybody's... um, 
bots, steel talon, starblade, these are all vector graphic 3D systems. Yeah. And Sega's already announced that they're working on one that's going to become uh, the Model 1 board uh, that we're going to get Virtual Fighter off of and Virtual Racing and those yeah. games. And so there's one side of the industry that's like, okay, we can't compete with sprite-based games on consoles. The Super Nintendo came out and stuff. We might as well shift gears to this 3D stuff that the consoles can't do. Yeah, That's Sounds one cool. idea. And the other idea is, wait, there's one-on-one -on -one fighters. And the Neo Geo is perfect for that. Mm -hmm. We're going to see world heroes, art of fighting, blah, 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 blah. And that's really what's going to put uh, Neo Geo on the map, is those one-on-one -on -one fighting games. Uh, but like I said, that Street Fighter II just proved that that works. Mortal Kombat is actually in development at this point. Uh, it's not that Mortal Kombat copies it. Mortal Kombat is a parallel development. Uh, it's just going to take a little bit longer for Mortal Kombat to hit uh, the street. Yeah. So and, the funny thing so, is yeah. that uh, you say one-on-one -on -one fighters is uh, what what uh, is special for the new you. I really don't care about one-on-one -on -one fighters. I love <laughs> the new you. There's so many great uh, games there. I, I um, agree with you. I agree with you. But from this first year, there's very few that really stand out. I mean, okay. uh, mag uh, what was it? Magic Candle or something? The one with the wizard uh, and the stick? Uh, that's it's a terribly forgettable game. Nom seventy six, also a game nobody remembers. Oh, that's quite good, actually, wasn't it? It, it? It's quite good, but it's just a cabal ripoff. Yes. At yeah. the end of the day, yeah. and it doesn't do anything cabal didn't already do mm. a little bit better. Uh, there's uh, there's that ninja spy game that is also basically a slight variation on the cabal slash operation wolf theme mm. uh you got a fantasy version of that as well around this time there's there's games coming out the potential is improving but it really will be the one-on-one -on -one fighters that define the system and then of course games like metal slug and neo turf masters and all yeah. those other games spin but those Master. are yes yeah, spin yeah. master but those are all Top still 100. a couple years down those are yeah. still a couple years away also what's going to have to happen is that the cartridge size is going to have to get bigger and neo drift out mate neo drift out is oh neo drift is out also a brilliant game i mean i love the neo geo as well i mean the metal slug series alone would justify its existence yeah add in puzzle bobble and now you're you're in stone cold classic territory mm. but it's going to be games like samurai showdown uh that are really going to put it on the map yeah okay yeah so let's get out of the arcade and back to the homes then the snes hits u.s shelves nintendo has begun shipping their 16-bit console to u.s retailers some have even paid for expedited shipping to get the hotly anticipated hardware onto store shelves as fast as possible the Big N has even prepared a new TV ad campaign targeting 9- to 14-year-old boys who have already owned an NES for two to three years and will be ready for an upgrade. Yeah, so I wonder how scared they were of launching this, seeing as the Genesis had been out there for a long time. I mean, it must have been uh, exciting times for Nintendo. Well, it's exciting times for Nintendo. Uh, this is also coming, as we've talked about in the show for the last uh, year or so, Nintendo has been under some pressure from the U.S. government because of their strong-arm tactics. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they've been threatening retailers with withholding stock. And uh, we've talked about a few times, every time you look in the toy trade publications, that like of the top five uh, revenue generating SKUs, at least two Nintendo versions of the NES are on there. So if you look at, you know, just by revenue, you got the top five toys, two of them, two of the slots are taken up by different package versions of the NES. Then you add in at least every time one or two NES cartridges. Nintendo telling you, if you carry this other guy's system or you do X, Y, or Z, we're just not going to deliver. You've just ruined that toy, uh, that toy store's revenue model. Yeah. 
True. It's 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 unbelievable the power that they've had. So they know the Super NES is going to do well, and they also know that they have prevented the Genesis from really grabbing a, a foothold. And so they are the one thing that they didn't anticipate or that they I don't think they saw coming was Sonic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And and we talked about this in last month's uh, 30 year jump that Sonic has become the pack and title for the Genesis in the U.S. Yeah, they're doing this literally a month before the Super Nintendo comes out there and they didn't even wait for the pack in boxes to arrive. They said, hey, you can buy the standard Genesis with Altered Beast pack in and we will give you a standalone copy of Sonic the Hedgehog. Mm. Yeah, and that was quite an impressive game. It, 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 in many ways, and this is what the advertising is also going to promote, it's fast, it's got attitude, that wonderful 90s kid attitude stuff. Uh, and if you look at Super Mario World, it's it looks beautiful, but he's moving very, very slow. Yeah. And do you want a slow moving game or do you want the fast game? Yeah, exactly. And we add to that that the Super NES is retailing for anywhere between $200 and $220. Mm. And this is an age, you know, there's still got a lot of mom and pop shops. You don't have the electronic boutique isn't, you know, the massive chain yet. So uh, there are there is some variance in the pricing. and But the Genesis is down to $150. Mm. So if you're a parent and and for the kids, I mean, especially that age group where, you know, they've got a little bit of their own stored money from birthdays or whatever, or maybe even side jobs, saving 50 bucks and getting the coolest new game is something that a lot of kids are going to be uh, considering. Yeah, definitely know what I would have bought back then. I mean, Genesis <laughs> all the way. I mean, there's no doubt that Sonic looks brilliant and moves so quickly, scrolls so so nicely. It's got a great soundtrack, but but let's be honest, Mario Super Mario is a better game. But oh, uh, by far, by far. There were so many arcade conversions for that Genesis that uh, that were already there and were coming down the line. It's um, it would be yeah. an, it would have been a no brainer for me back then. Today, I know better. I'd probably choose this NES. <laughs> well, see, this is the thing. I, I remember seeing the Genesis and being astonished by it in 89. And I remember the first time I saw a Super NES, and it wasn't Mario. I saw it playing F-Zero. Mm, yeah. And that's when I realized, oh, no, 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 no. We have a new game. There's there, it. The game has changed. It's not no longer about, can you produce more colors on screen or more sprites can you do some new trick we haven't seen before yeah and yeah the moment i saw mode seven all yeah. bets were off that was <laughs> it that was it there's no no we don't have to talk about anything else this is the future and i had the same feeling year a few years later when i saw the first playstation and i played wipeout on it and i was like okay we we've now this any, anything that can't play Wipeout is just not worth looking at. Yeah. That was, yeah. Granted, I didn't own consoles at all back then. I was still a computer player for many, yeah. many years. But Me too. Hey, you know. Yeah. Uh, we Europeans, we. <laughs> <laughs> so let's stick with Sega. Sega yes. buys Virgin Mastertronic. Sega has purchased Virgin Mastertronic. We discussed back in July that Sega had bought back the distribution rights to the Sega line of console products, which Virgin Mastertronic had held since 1988. Now, Sega has gone ahead and purchased Virgin Mastertronic's distribution apparatus to incorporate into Sega Europe. Virgin will hold on to the software publishing arm of its operations and rebrand that Virgin Interactive Entertainment. So getting back some control of their hardware sales. Yeah, I mean, Sega has uh, had a long history of failure in uh, the hardware sale selling business. Yeah. Uh, you can look at in the US, they had their deal with Tonko that did never figured out how to sell the master system. In Europe, uh, it was Virgin Mastertronic that made the master system a household name. Mm. Without 
uh, Virgin Mastertronic, uh, Sega wouldn't have had a foothold going into the 16-bit uh, generation. So it made sense for them. Uh, I mean, it was weird in July when they just bought back the distribution rights. And I, I think I even commented then, I was like, okay, what, what are they doing here? Mm. But now they just did the smart thing, which was buy the existing distribution ch- uh, apparatus, you know, the the employee co- uh, taking over the employees, taking over everything that Virgin Mastertronic has done to get the Sega name out there and build off of that. And they will make Europe a very Genesis friendly, especially the UK, Genesis friendly uh, environment. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So, Raymond E. Feist, 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 Feist to come Feist. to the, the TurboGrafx-16. Ah, the third party, the, uh, the third system. Renowned fantasy author Raymond E. Feist is set to have his Rift War Saga series of books converted into games for the TurboGrafx-16 by Kid Source Corporation. Kid Source is also planning to license other literary works for game adaptations. So I've known nothing about the Rift War Saga series. Uh, have Enlighten you, me here. Okay. Have you ever heard of the Sierra Games Betrayal at Krondor and yep. Return to Krondor? Yes. Those are based off the Rift War series. Of okay. Books. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, Feist is uh, fairly well known in uh, those circles. I honestly have never read any of his books either. But uh, the thing is... This company, Kid Source Corporation, I tried to find information on them. There's virtually nothing out there except a couple of stories about this licensing deal. Okay. And the fact that they were targeting the, the and I'm sure that uh, Ethan is going to be able to fill in some gaps here, but uh, the games never appear. The Turbo Graphic 16 at this point is really on its last legs in North America. There, there's, it's still going to be going uh, very strongly in Japan for several more years, but in the states, it's losing ground. And once the Super NES shows up, it's pretty much game over. Yeah. But uh, the fact that Kid Source is trying to do this suggests to me that similar to CinemaWare which also, you know, got investment from NEC, and that's why we got the CD versions of uh, It Came From the Desert and a whole bunch of other CinemaWare games ported or released on the Turbo Graphics. It just uh, feels like, you know, they probably got some money from, NE- uh, from NEC. This is pure speculation, but they probably got some money from NEC. That got them uh, uh, the license, and they're like, yeah, we'll do this, and this will be a way in, and it's well-known property that we can get on the cheap because, you know, nobody's licensing fantasy novels for games yet. But, uh, yeah. And ultimately, Sierra will pick up that license. I don't know if they get it through KidSource or if they get it themselves, and Dynamics uh, is going to develop those two Crondor games in 93 and 98. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, news for me. News for me. So mm. LucasArts transitions to Photoshop. Oh, yeah. This one's a good one. Computer Gaming World profiles the next two big blockbuster point-and-click adventures from LucasArts. Monkey Island 2 and Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. While Indy is still getting its backdrops made in EA's classic deluxe paint, Monkey Island's backdrops are being created in Photoshop the up-and-coming program that was developed by an Industrial Light and Magic employee. Wonderful games, dear. Wonderful games. Oh, yeah, yeah. The graphic I mean, style in both the Indie, Indie 4 and, and Monkey Island 2 is just, uh, just brilliant. Yeah, but you can actually tell there's a difference in their styles. Mm, yes. You know, if you look at the Monkey Island 2 ones, they really look like... Uh, that they were scanned in hand-drawn art. They're a lot more cartoony. Um, so, so yes, definitely looks more like uh, hand-drawn art than the uh, the more detailed backdrops of, uh, of, of Indiana Jones 4. Exactly. And this ha- comes down to the way that they're processing the images at this point. Okay. And uh, Deluxe Paint is still very much geared 
um, to the Amiga. Uh, I mean, that's where it has its origins. Now, there, there's PC versions of it, of course, but it's still very much a pixel art type of thing. Mm -hmm. And you can tell the, the Industrial Light and Magic um, movie-esque uh, approaches that underlie the way Photoshop does graphics uh, really lend themselves to, you know, scanning in hand-drawn art, retouching it a little bit. Now, they're still doing all the animation in deluxe paint. So that's why if you go back and look at Monkey Island 2, mm. the backdrops and the sprites don't always feel like they're matching up. Okay. Uh, because the sprites are still, you know, a fairly uh, low palette, very crisp uh, sprites. And then suddenly you have this background, you know, where the edges are all a little, just a little blurry, even at the low resolution, because of the way they were processed. Mm. And uh, and you and you can tell. So deluxe paint is still the tool that they're using for this, uh, and it's the fact that they're now, you know, moving to scanned art. They're moving to new tools. It really is kind of the end of Deluxe Paint. And, you know, Deluxe Paint is responsible for things like Guybrush's name. So, yes. yep. you know, the, the the tool in Deluxe Paint for creating animated sprites was uh, you would save them as a quote-unquote brush. So the file name was Brush. And the, they didn't have a name for the character, so they called him Guy.Brush. And that yep. stuck as the name for the character. So uh, Deluxe Paint is a venerable piece of software and it's been the industry standard up until this point. And this was just like this transition moment when Photoshop is coming in. I don't believe EA was all that keen on continuing to invest in these kind of commercially available tools anyway. Deluxe Paint 5, and it's, no, Deluxe Paint 4, I believe, is being advertised in all the magazines at this month. Uh, but I I don't think it's going to stand up to Photoshop. Oh no! And it's funny because uh, you say LucasArts is uh, working with the Deluxe Paint, and that would be on the Amiga, of course. LucasArts were most definitely a PC house even back then. I mean, PC was the the prime uh, target for all of their games. And uh, actually, I'd say anybody who would uh, play Monkey Island Two today, you'd have to be bloody stupid to play it on the Amiga, not only because of the disc swapping, but also because it's it's so much worse than what you actually get on the PC, where you have the iMuse system, which is not not there on the Amiga at all, for example, that, that dynamically changes the music and the composition based on what's happening in the game and the graphics are better. Every, everything is just better on the PC versions, but still they had these Amigas working with the Deluxe Paint to get everything done. Well, and that's the thing. The the tools EA developed uh, were so perfect for game development that there was no reason to use anything else. I mean, uh, imagine if you wanted to do an animated sprite uh, like uh, and do anything similar to what Deluxe Paint does with the brushes. You just can't do it in Photoshop. No. Uh, you can't, you know, put in 20 frames of animation and just tell it, okay, we want to run it and then change the, the speed of running it and stuff. Mm. Uh, all, all of that stuff was designed so that you could actually mock up an animation of what the game would look like before you actually built the game. Yeah. And that's all missing from Photoshop because that's not the point of Photoshop. But when you're dealing with a point-and-click adventure game where you have, you know, these very elaborate still image backgrounds, well, Photoshop becomes the only tool that makes sense. Yeah, and I guess yeah. it's still being used today for this very purpose. Oh, definitely. I mean, no, what other tool would you use? I mean, granted, there's there's a ton of clones of Photoshop mm. that do very similar things. I don't have Photoshop on my computer anymore. I mean couldn't afford it nope, it's, uh, it's way too expensive for us amateurs but you know the, it, the concepts that it introduced and the way it processed data is the underlying tech of everything i mean i use affinity nowadays that's that's my go-to okay. just because the license was cheap enough um yeah so yeah go figure it's it is what it is and it's an end of an era 
yeah i used to love playing around with the deluxe paint but uh yeah. so let's let's move along so we've got the first ad for strike commander coming out oh yes the wing commander spin-off would not hit shelves until april of 1993. so i've actually never heard of strike commander really never. okay I, and i played uh, the wing commander games love those but never yeah. heard of strike commander Okay, so uh, like I said, Wing Commander 2 gets its very first review. And there's only one magazine that reviews it in an October issue. The rest are going to review it next month. And so that just gives you a rough idea of where we are. Uh, Wing Commander works because it's in space and there's no, there's no ground, basically. Strike Commander is a uh, near future, so basically modern tech uh flight sim on earth so now they have to render the ground mm. it's trying to use the same type of tech as wing commander so you're not doing vector based ships you're using pre-rendered images of ships in you know a variety of positions that you just store in memory and then shift as you know you get close to a different position and stuff and uh, the game is extremely ambitious but unfortunately, a little too ambitious. Uh, the computer that you're going to need to run it when it finally comes out in 93 is just a monster. I mean, Wing Commander needed a monster machine. The yeah. machine that actually runs Strike Commander well pretty much doesn't exist in the consumer world <laughs> yet. Uh, okay. You're going to have to wait like two or three more years before you can buy a machine that can run Strike Commander when it finally comes out in 93, let alone them advertising it in 91. And uh, so if you finally get a computer that can run it, is it then a good game? Not really. No. OK. <laughs> and and uh, I mean, I haven't played a lot of it. I've played a little bit of it, but uh, it has some serious flaws, both in its plot. It, it isn't as interesting as Wing Commander 1 and 2 was uh, the the whole uh, allure of Wing Commander with the cutscenes and, you know, the multiple uh, pathways. If you know, if in Wing Commander 1, if you don't play very well in one mission, you know, the, the, the general feel of the campaign goes down and morale yeah. drops and the missions change slightly and all this stuff. Well, uh, Strike Commander, I believe, does some of that as well, but because it's in the real world, you start getting into all sorts of problematic ways that it's constructing its story and stuff and mm. real world events and all this other it basically becomes a mess and it gets away from them okay. to the point where it not only is it not playable but it's also just not that good of a game so it doesn't really work as a high-end flight simulator even though it requires that hardware and you've got games like Falcon, and uh, I think it comes out the same year as F-15 Strike Eagle 3. Okay. And it just can't compete, you know, uh, with those other games. And so, yeah, Strike Commander becomes a huge problem. They also end up doing a World War II spinoff, which is, I think, uh, Pacific Strike or something like this, I can't yeah. remember, which also gets some mixed reviews because, well, the dialogue scenes are very much authentic, which means that there's a whole bunch of racist crap in there and stuff. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, this whole idea of doing spinoffs of the Wing Commander series just dies after a couple of years. But uh, Strike Commander's infamously going to be this delayed game it comes out in april of 93 which means it totally misses the christmas season mm, okay. uh and the fact that they're advertising here already i remember seeing the it, it's always the same advertisement it's just no actual screenshots of the game it's this pre-rendered scene of a jet flying straight up with an explosion in some city or something behind it and they still end up using that as the package art later on when the game comes out. Uh, so it's it, they're branding it really strongly. I think it's just it was a bridge too far for them at that time. Okay. Yeah. Too bad, too bad. I love the Wing Commander mm -hmm. series, but uh, yeah, hey oh, 
So Bullfrog to self-publish someday. <laughs> exactly. Bullfrog, makers of Populous and Powermonger, have announced plans to become a publisher of their own games. Their next two titles, Populous 2 and Bob, which would later be renamed Syndicate, will still be published by Electronic Arts, though. Ultimately, Bullfrog would continue to work with EA to either publish or distribute their games until they would finally be bought by EA in 1995. So they didn't actually self-publish. No, no, so I, no. I'm just wondering, for this story, the, the only thing that really caught my eye is why on earth would Syndicate be called Bob while, while they were working on it? I wonder if it's uh, an abbreviation for something. Uh, well, uh, uh, Bullfrog was... Uh, a bullfrog's design uh, philosophy was always about iteration. Mm. So when the game first started, it was a very, very different thing. Like around this time, you're still seeing pictures of Bob as a prototype game uh, in uh, magazines. And the whole idea of the futuristic cyberpunk thing doesn't exist yet. Okay. Uh, you know, you, there's one picture I, I remember very clearly. It's green grass and these red brick buildings. It's basically more or less a let's build a game engine, see what kind of thing works, and then we'll skin it. Yeah. <laughs> and this is how they develop their games. And I mean, when you consider their output and the type of games they produced, more power to them because yeah. this stuff was amazing. Yeah, but it also explains why they very rarely had games with, you know, a fleshed out single player campaign. If you look yeah. at a game like Populous or Power Monger, it, it, the levels are just um, uh, algorithmically generated. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, well, Syndicate is, a, is a, some, somewhat different in that regard, at least. It is somewhat different, but how many people do you know have actually played through Syndicate? It gets so hard later on. I, I tried a couple of times. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, it's not it a well thought out thing. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a well thought out campaign. Nobody uh, plays their not. games to the end. Powermonger, I don't know anybody who's ever even gotten no. halfway through that thing. No. Uh, it's one of those things where, and, and they did a lot, and this is why most of their games were also network playable. Mm. Because that's how they would test. That's how they would figure out if the games were fun or not. So they were never really designed to be single player experiences, mm. or they would iterate just long enough until the game was a lot of fun, and then they'd ship it. So I mean, yeah, it it does create these wonderful, engaging, and very very memorable games. But they're not games that you're going to play through. They don't, they don't have that level of care and detail that like a Japanese console game has at this point in time. No, but that's true about pretty much everything released on the Amiga <laughs> and C64 <laughs> and all of the computers. I mean, we, we just could, couldn't design as well as the Japanese did back then. I mean, well, it's not just that. Remember, uh, we're not. We couldn't sell a game for sixty bucks. Oh, that's true. And not worry about piracy, nope. and you know, and keep it on the shelf for six months or a year. Yeah, at full price. Uh, at full price, hmm. where at, which is what you could do with a console game. We had to put it out there for twenty to thirty pounds. You know, maybe forty bucks, fifty bucks, uh, sometimes less, and within six weeks everybody had a copy of it yeah and within 12 months we had to sell it now for 10 or 12 quid you know in a budget label so that really changed the equation yeah, of how much time and care you could actually put into a thing like uh did we properly design level 12. Mm. no and speaking of exactly that the one exactly. asks if piracy is killing the software industry. Nice. The growth of the computer games industry has also brought the world of software piracy into the limelight. Will it kill the industry? According to the Federation Against Software Theft, the problem will ultimately lead to publishers' inability to reinvest in development. Don't copy that floppy. 
don't copy that floppy. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and this is an interesting article uh, the one has where they talk to a bunch of people in these different organizations. Uh, and it very much is something that is going to hurt the uh, European industry, I believe, more than the U.S. or the Jap Japanese industry. Yeah. Uh, and it is one of those things where uh, when you think about it, and I don't know if this was a it definitely wasn't a conscious decision, but it definitely had that effect that if you were developing a game like, let's say, Wing Commander, where the only people who can play the game have like a two and a half thousand dollar computer and 91 money at home. Uh, play it properly. I'm not going to talk about the people with the 286, you know, turning off all the features and stuff. Mm. But play it properly, you need you know, this massive machine, you're less likely to pirate it than somebody who's picking up, you know, a $500 Amiga 500 and, uh, you know, they've got their floppy disk drive, they're never going to buy a hard drive. So you can never target a more sophisticated hardware platform for them, but they're also going to be the more likely ones to pirate uh, the games. Yeah. Yeah. So you can make your money. You're going to make more sales if you're targeting a more affluent customer base. Uh, and that is going to hurt all those developers that are focused on Amigas, well, the Atari ST is basically already a non-issue at this point. Mm, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so it's it's sad, but uh, very much true. Yes, yes. So uh, speaking of these crackers who crack the game so that they can be pirated, Playtime profiles Norwegian Cracker Party? Yes, the German gaming mag Playtime has an interesting report from a demo scene party in Norway. They follow a German cracker and demo team, Alexion, as they compete in a demo competition at the event that has been organized in a school. So at least these guys were doing demos and not cracking uh, legitimate software. Mm, well, the at, demos at, were at just... This party they did. <laughs> at, at this party, they were showing off a demo. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea here was uh, they, they all came in, they had this big school uh, assembly room or whatever rented for the event, and uh, they were given a certain number of hours to create a demo on site. Yeah. And so that's what they were doing. But yes, there's hints in the article that all the other things you would expect from crackers was also going on. So mm. while they were demoing, they were also, you know, these are still the guys who are basically cracking the software copy protections and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, it was and a different time. It was a different time, but you know, it, it, also, when just reading this article, and it's uh, written sort of like a, uh, a mini diary, you know, every hour or so, the guy's writing, you know, what he's seeing, the reporter's writing what they're seeing, and it very much reflects the, uh, the demo scene parties that you still see today for systems like the Amiga and the Commodore 64. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. Yeah, indeed. It's nice that these things are still alive today. Yeah, definitely. Uh, something that I've always just witnessed from very, very much afar, unfortunately. Yeah, me too. Never attended any of them. Hmm. So and if anybody so, wants to invite us, we're, we're, we're available. Yeah, yeah Maybe. indeed. We'll, we'll, we'll make some time. Okay. So Spanish magazine Hobby Consolas premieres. The console sister mag to Micro Hobby, the Spanish Spectrum mag, gets its first issue this month. The magazine is still going strong today. So this has been running for 30 years now. Yeah. The same magazine. That's it. Same magazine. Yeah. Is it still relevant then? Uh, definitely. I mean, the Spanish market is still one with uh, good magazines. There's yeah. another magazine, uh, Micromania, which is a computer uh, game magazine that's going to start, I believe, in 84. Five, maybe eighty-six, and they're still running today as well. Mm, yeah, yeah, impressive. Yeah, yeah, I wish I wish there were more big magazines like the one that we're going to mention now. PC format launches in the UK. 
The rise of the DOS-compatible computer in Europe is further shown with the launch in the UK of PC Format, a dedicated games mag for the IBM clone market. The mag would run until 2015. Yeah, so I used to read the one in the Amiga format and PC format and PC PC Gamer and yeah, lots of magazines and mm -hmm. they'd always be there, readily available in every bookstore or at a uh, at any small uh, small shop really in, in Denmark back in the day. But uh, these days they're hard to come by. Oh, definitely. I mean, they virtually don't exist nowadays. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the big ones. Uh, the biggest loss was probably, uh, what's it called? Uh, computer and video games. That's yes. the oldest yep. one. That, and we just talked about the first issue of that launching 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in, in the United States, computer gaming world also launched the same month 40 years ago. So uh, it's it's one of those things where these these big old time magazines they just didn't survive the dawn of digital news reporting on games no, unfortunately no. sadly yeah but uh, at least there are a couple of good fan fan magazines these days as well have, have yeah, you jumped into true. the new um, the new Amiga fan magazine the UK one <sighs> I know Amiga you're ready for it I haven't. And the problem is that if I order any more physical media, my wife is going to kill me because I still buy comic books. <laughs> so, okay, uh, okay. you can't have I, that, I, dude. I, I wish you guys don't make it available as a PDF that you can purchase, do you? Yeah, I think they do actually. I I, I buy the uh, the physical, and, and I actually haven't been writing for them the past two months because I've been far too busy. But I'll get back on oh. that at some point. Yeah, no, uh, I mean. I'd love to uh, add the there's that other C64 fanzine. Uh, what's freeze. it called? Uh, freeze, freeze, 64. freeze, freeze 64. And I had a subscription to that for a short while. Mm -hmm. Problem was that uh, number one, the magazines piled up and number two, I just didn't get around to reading them anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the last three or four, I just just sat there and it's one of those problems that when you do a podcast like this one, I mean, I put in about 10 hours of research every month, yeah. uh, every week, sorry, every week on this. Reading old magazines instead. Reading old magazines. Mm. Uh, dude, I don't even get to play anymore pretty much because <laughs> of this. Yes. Uh, and I was talking to one of my students about it. He's actually, him and some friends are developing a RTS game right now. Yeah. And we were talking about it and, you know, I was filling him in on some of the old classics and stuff like this. And then I'm thinking, I haven't played anything new in 10 years, pretty much, <laughs> because I just don't have time. But, hey, you know, this uh, we're recording this now, actually, on the 7th of November. This month marks the third anniversary of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. So I only have seven more years of this, and then I'm free. So let's do it. It's, it's not that bad. In seven more years, I can play games again. Yeah, yeah. You can look forward <laughs> to that at least. <laughs> That's good. So let's go to the last piece of news for this time. It's uh, Japan is training the next generation of game developers. Amidst ever-increasing demand for game output, multiple companies have started game development training programs. Ace Magazine features one, Human Creative School, launched by game dev Human Inc., the school would be sold off when the developer went belly up in 1999 and would finally shut its doors in 2003. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, we've talked a little bit before. There's been some previous stories about uh, trying to formalize game development in the West. Yeah. And this, this, this shift here in Japan, this idea that, you know, they, there's so much demand for new games at this point, and uh, the console market is so hot, and uh, so much of it is not just being sold in Japan, but also elsewhere, uh, that they need more game developers, that this is now a career, uh, the new version of the salary man, if you will, yeah. uh, is kind of a cool concept, uh, especially because the school lasts for as long as it does. 
So these are, uh, you, you call them game development training programs here. Is that uh, an education along the lines of a university education you get here, or is it something you would attend after you got some degree in computer science, for example, programming, and then, then you, you go to this school? Uh, I honestly don't know. I found okay. an old TV ad for it, mm. but unfortunately, I speak no Japanese, so I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm kind of stuck here. I don't know the extent to which these are like, you know, maybe a a twelve month, um, a quick little okay. extended education program. If it's something that you might attend directly out of high school, uh, that I don't know. Okay. Uh, so I can't, I can't judge that. Oh, but still, still interesting that they already in in ninety one had uh, dedicated schools or training programs for for game development. Yeah, and the fact that it was around for this long means mm. that there were people going there and paying money yeah. to keep it going. Uh, and the fun thing is, it's also started by a game development company. So that you know, it's it's not just these guys training you know people as a standalone business but it's coming from the developers themselves so they know what they need basically they know what the the market is deficient in yeah which yeah. helps yeah, yeah it's indeed. not just somebody trying to scam people you know be like oh you want to be in games here but give us you know money and we'll, <laughs> we'll train you to be in games yeah yeah street cred is important okay so that is the end of our time jump to October of 1991. Mads, one important mission is still left. You must give us the word of the episode. The word of the episodes. Hmm. Quite simply just Photoshop, because that would be a giant uh, leap for the, the game development uh, community as such going forward. I I agree wholeheartedly. Photoshop it is. So, Matt, uh, thank you once again for uh, coming in here and helping us. Uh, you being the retro gaming podcast veteran uh, among us. Uh, please tell the folks at home where they can find you. Yeah, thanks for having me, mate. Um, you can find me at the Retro Asylum podcast where I monthly release some some well one or twice once or twice a month release an episode uh, these days mostly the game club episodes is what we are focusing on chris and i um you can also find me on the playthrough podcast where i'm playing modern or middle-aged games instead and those are deep dives into a single game i mean sometimes we do five episodes on one game and uh, just uh us, it's us four middle-aged guys playing some middle-aged games and discussing them in, in great detail. So if, if you're into that kind of thing and that kind of drawn out waffle as that is, just check me out there. Very cool. And I'll put all the links to that in the show notes as per usual. Uh, Mads, again, thanks for being here. And uh, hopefully we will see you again soon on one of our trips through time. I'll see you.